Hi, my name is Kathy Moyne and we're here at Green Thumb Nursery in Lake Forest to talk about monarch butterflies. So they are such an awesome creature to see in your garden and we all have a, a spot in our heart for them and we want them to do well. So there's a lot of information out there about the decline of the monarch population. So I just wanted to, d to address some of those issues and see if we can't come to some kind of understanding as to how we can all make, make it better for the monarch butterfly. So I've got lots of information to cover, so I'm gonna get started now. And I do have to read some of this stuff because there's a lot of info and I don't wanna get it wrong. And isn't, as I'm getting older, I kinda of miss some things. So I don't wanna do that. So I'm just gonna talk about um, their life cycle and then we're going to go into some of the things that is causing a problem with their with their um, population decline all right so first their life cycle their biology female the adult female lays 300 to 800 eggs and the female can lay up to 250 eggs in one day could you imagine glad I'm not a monarch mom and, and of which, the, of those 250, only 20 will survive. So they know that there's going to be a lot of things going to take out their babies. So they lay lots and lots of eggs. So that should hopefully make you feel a little better when some of your baby caterpillars die. Because there's a lot of reasons they can die. So they lay one egg at a time per leaf. So the, when you see them land, you'll see their little tail curl up under and they're laying an egg on that leaf. The eggs, you can see them, they're the size of a pinhead, and the caterpillar will emerge in about three to five days. So then when the, the caterpillar comes out, they go through five stages. They're called instars, and it takes about two weeks. Um, once they hatch, the baby comes out of the egg and it eats the egg sac first, and then it's ready to take its first bite into the milkweed leaf. Now milkweeds have a, a, um, a white latex substance in the leaves, so when they bite into it, sometimes that latex will gum up the mouth of the baby and the baby dies right there. So he doesn't even get a chance to move on. So and this kind of ensures that the, only the, the, the strongest one survives. So it's kind of like, you know, mother nature taking care of things, making sure that only the strong ones survive. So like I said, that first bite can be deadly. Now if it survives that first bite, he rests and then he, molt, he molts again. So that's three days it takes about for that to happen. So then he goes into his second instar, which also takes three days. And they eat at that point a leaf or two. So that, and their color starts to change. So then they, pu they, they, they actually shed their skin each time they go through these different stages. And that, wouldn't that be nice, a little exfoliation, get rid of that skin? So then the third instar, which is another one to three days, the caterpillar has got more color and he's starting to grow his little tentacles, his little, little um, uh, antenna and his little tentacles in the back. So they have two in front, two in back. Um, on their fourth instar, which is in again another three, one to three days, they are about an inch long and they can eat a whole leaf in under an hour. So that's when we got the people running down here looking for milkweed because uh, they've eaten all my leaves. So now we've got the fifth instar, three to five days this one takes because this is their final stage before their pupation. And they move fast to find a place for them to pupate. Now if you notice, most of them do not pupate on the plant that they were eating. They crawl away and they go somewhere else. Usually you'll find them hanging underneath a windowsill or up underneath an umbrella or a plant, uh, you know, a vine or something that they're hanging off of, but they usually are not on the milkweed itself. So sometimes you'll see them crawling off somewhere. I've been tempted to, where are you going? Go back up. They might be going to pupate, so don't mess with them. They kind of know what they're doing, unfortunately. So then on his last stage, he will go and find and attach himself and he'll hang upside down and they do that all in those stages. But on this last stage, when he pupates, he forms a chrysalis or she forms a chrysalis and inside of that chrysalis their mouth part changes from a chewing to a sucking 
because when they come out as butterflies they go after nectar plants which I have a whole big table of nectar plants right here that we sell that work for them and other butterflies as well they also when they're in there they're they're growing their wings and this takes about 10 to 14 days the whole thing takes about a month from the time they get out of their egg to the time that they're actually flying so once the butterfly emerges he takes about an hour for the wings to plump up for flight so they're kind of crinkled up and you'll see them opening up and then they'll start flapping them a little bit and it takes about an hour for them to get the, the moisture into their wings so they're nice and full and plump they fly off then looking for the nectar plants and they call these migratory pollinators they're what they do migrate from place to place which is what causes some of their problems or issues the decline is when they're they're migrating and a lot of their decline is when they're overwintering so then we're going to talk about their migration patterns now they they most all of them journey north so from wherever they're overwintering they journey north so they are either way down south in in mexico like almost down into south america and they are in texas and then there's a there is a population in florida that does not migrate and then there is the northern california group that that migrates there or that overwinters there well they all kind of head north except for the ones who don't migrate and they go from those southern locations up to southern canada and it takes four generations for them to get there from where they start to where they're going to end up and then there's one final the last generation the fourth generation goes back down to where it's going to overwinter and they all kind of know where they're going I mean it's kind of instinctual so they um, they follow the milkweed bloom which is why it's important for us to have milkweeds for them because that is the only host plant they only lay eggs on the on the milkweed so the first generation starts usually mid-march and then it goes uh, then the second generation is usually May through July the third generation is July through August and the fourth generation is September through October so they're they're laying eggs and doing their thing in that area and then laying more eggs and doing thing in, and they and they take four generations that one generation dies off then the next one goes and then the next one and then the next one so the last generation they call a super generation and what's really interesting about them is they actually they're not even they don't even develop the same way um, their southern journey is usually from November to February so that's why we see them coming back down a lot of times we'll see them flitting through the garden and they are they are um, they it can take them up to eight months to get back down depending upon how far they're going if they're if they came from southern Mexico it's going to take them a while to get from Canada down to southern Mexico so and that makes it a super generation too they can fly 250 miles a day and up to 3,000 total so they catch the thermals and they can fly one mile high they can also store more fat they're able to store more fat so they can actually survive a little bit longer in between coming down to get nectar and they, they, they conserve energy by riding the trade winds so they can actually fly up pretty high and and actually ride the trade winds um, and they don't mate or lay eggs there are actually no sexual organs in there and they go into what they call sexual diapause and that just means that their sexual organs don't develop until they're ready to after they overwinter to come back so again like I said they're able to store more fat at that time too so they they're really a super generation right so they normally overwinter in the Sierra Madre mountain range and in um, in evergreen trees in Pismo Beach and eucalyptus trees and that's um, October through February and they also uh, overwinter in Texas in evergreens there um, they do have one of the problems with the, the um, tropical milkweed is that they can get a, um, 
uh, an overtaxing of a parasite that follows the monarch. So we're going to talk about it. It's called OE. Uh, it's, I can't give you the Latin name. It's just too hard to say. So they call OE. Most people know OE parasite. And that parasite kind of lives with the monarch. I mean, it's kind of something that they've dealt with for years and years and years. It hasn't killed them off yet. So they, they have figured out ways of combating that parasite. And so we're going to go a little bit into that. So let me explain how the parasite works. The parasite actually lives inside of the caterpillar. So it has to be eaten as a, as a caterpillar. Um, and, and it's only the caterpillars that are infected with the parasite. Um, it is not transfer from caterpillar to caterpillar. So if you're seeing dead caterpillars on your plant, nine times out of ten, it's not the parasite. The parasite does not kill them generally, it just makes them weak. And again, that's, uh, you know, uh, survival of the fittest. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about the relationship between the tropical milkweed and the, and the parasite, actually. Um, the adult, it, it, like I said, it doesn't kill them, it's a parasite, so it has to live on that host. If it kills its host, it won't have anything to live off of. So what happens is those spores, there's little spores that get that, that end up getting on the egg sac. When the caterpillar comes out and eats its egg sac, it also eats those spores. Then those spores go down into the gut of, out of, the, gut of the caterpillar and became, become viable and they become that parasite. So um, the caterpillar, let's see, the spore comes alive in the gut of the caterpillar. Um, when it pupates, when it goes into the chrysalis, that spore comes out of the caterpillar body and attaches itself to the adult um, butterfly on the outside. So when it goes to pupate or come out of the out of the chrysalis, it also will release a lot of those spores and they fold, they they come down like glitter. They actually are very light and they kind of float down like glitter, which is another reason why I think they crawl off of that that their host plant and go attach somewhere else just in case so that they're not infecting the other caterpillar eggs that might be laid on that plant. So then, <clears throat> now you can't, now the problem that arises with the tropical milkweed is back in the day when we first started selling the tropical milkweeds many years ago, about five or six years ago, we were colder and the, and the tropical milkweeds would go dormant in the winter. Well, now that we're warmer, they don't go dormant. Your native milkweeds completely die down to the ground in the winter time, so that eliminates that buildup of parasites on the leaves. So one of the solutions is just to cut down your milkweed in, in the fall, in about November or so, cut it down to the ground, eliminate all those leaves, and then that that's eliminates that buildup the, of the parasite. Now the monarch population in Florida has has that's all they live with is tropical milkweed. So I'll talk a little bit about better more about how that happens and why it's not a problem with the parasite for them. Anyway, you can disinfect your plants with a one to nineteen ratio of bleach to water, and you can spray spray your plants. Um, if you know there's no eggs on there or caterpillars on there, that's one way to help to get rid of that parasite on actively growing plants. So what is the problem with, what's the decline? Why are they declining? And some of the things, there's a few interesting facts that um, I came up with when I was um, researching this. And there's a lot of information on the internet, guys. Um, I searched through and, and picked only the ones that were the professionals in the butterfly world, the entomologists, people who raise these all the time. There's a Texas, there's a farm down in Texas that that's what they do. They raise monarch butterflies, they do studies on them. There's still more information out there on, you know, and they're still running studies all the time. The monarch knows that she's infected and she will actually seek out the tropical milkweed. Now let me show you, this is... This is a tropical milkweed. This is Asclepius carassifolia, or carassifolia. And this one is the one that's kind of people are having a little issue with. Now we also carry, we also carry the natives. We have, this one is a narrow leaf. And this one is 
a th woolly pod. So this one is also, there's different ones we're carrying. Now the thing about the tropical milkweed is because it grows quickly, it's easy to um, reproduce and it's fairly inexpensive to get the supplies out to the stores. The, the native milkweed is a little bit slower to get started and, and it's not as easy to propagate and there's not as many growers that grow that particular plant. So, so the tropical milkweed is actually helpful in the fact that it grows quickly. It, it's quickly in the spring when those cat when the butterflies that first group that first generation is looking for a place to a lay their eggs. And if the the native milkweeds are still sleeping because it took us a while to finally get our supply in, then they're 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 going to either die off or and not be able to lay their eggs because there's no place to lay their eggs. Whereas the tropical milkweed is there ready for them. It grows very quickly and that gives them a place to lay their eggs. They also, the tropical milkweed has a steroid in there and I'll explain that a little bit later. But here's some fun facts. In 2016, with more gardeners planting tropical milkweed, the overwintering butterfly population in Mexico grew 3.5 times from 57 million to 200 million. So that's just with a few people buying tropical milkweed and adding that to their garden. There, most of the states where it freezes, they can buy. They do the tropical milkweed all the time because it's it dies down. It doesn't, you know, they don't have to worry about it because we, us, Florida, Texas, and those areas where the tropical milkweed does not go dormant, then we have to be a little more careful with how we handle that tropical milkweed. Tropical milkweed has been present in extreme southern Florida for at least 100 years. There is a, a Dr. Fred Utquhart, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, is he wrote a book called The Monarch Butterfly, and it was in the International Traveler, page 98. He stated that in 1951, he traveled to the peninsula of Florida and found monarchs there in the winter. He also found them in California and Mexico and concluded that not all monarch butterflies migrated. Well, there's a small percentage of them that don't, and that's okay. They figured it out. So in another, the, in the summer 2012 issue of American Butterflies, it was devoted to the monarchs. And in that article, it talks about and some Mexican researchers explain how the computer models predicted that the Oyamel forests that currently support the Mexican overwintering monarchs will succumb to global warming, leaving monarchs with no overwintering grounds. So in a way, it's a good thing that they're actually populating other areas because, I mean, they're, they're figuring it out. They know. They're not, they're not dumb. <laughs> Many of the monarchs born in the American West overwinter in the California coast. The overwhelming number of overwintering sites are in groves of non-native blue eucalyptus and the earliest record of monarchs overwintering in California is from 1864. So they've been doing this a while. This is not their first rodeo. So when the mon when the monarch has the parasite and that's one of the things that you know they were saying that's causing the decline when they have the parasite they seek out the the tropical milkweed it has cardinaloids or cardinalides which is a toxic steroid chemical so it makes the monarchs poisonous to others to other insects or predators birds whatever and it also causes that spore to be smaller and weak. So it actually, it, it causes the spores not to have the hold on it. And that also, the higher the steroid in the level of the milkweed is the more of the redu reduction of the parasite load on, the, on the, the monarch. So the tropical milkweed is high in that particular steroid, which is a reason why they they seek it out they will actually look for the tropical milkweed they love the tropical milkweed for that reason so the another the other reason was that they said that the tropical milkweed would cause them to not want to migrate well that's not right because the fourth generation doesn't even lay eggs it's not even thinking about laying eggs now it might come down and get some nectar on its way down 
but it's not going to stop and go, oh, I'm going to lay eggs and start a generation right here. It just doesn't do that. It, it's, not, it's not programmed to do that. So that's not going to, the tropical milkweed is not going to cause them not to migrate, and it's not going to cause them to be killed by the parasite. And then the, the uh, let's see, what was the third reason? I mean, there was another reason. Um, oh, well, again, if you just may, I, I suggest that you plant both, Put, have both your, not, your natives and your tropical milkweeds. Um, and then just make sure you cut back your tropical milkweeds in, in the fall, in November, to, 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 to alleviate any of those problems. If you're worried about them not migrating or if you're worried about them causing an issue with the parasite, just cut them down. Then that, that takes care of it. So some of the things that, that was very obvious about how they're being, the, their populations are declining is that here, um, from the uh, Texas Butterfly Ranch, causes of monarch population decline, drought, genetically modified crops, late summer wildfires, and generally inhospitable conditions pose multiple threats to monarchs and their migrations. So not only was Texas in a drought or is in a drought, we're in a drought. So a lot of those milkweeds, native milkweeds, don't get enough water to even grow. So, and then you've got fires. We've had fires take things out uh, here and in Texas. So, you know, the, and then you got down in Florida, you've got, and the southern coasts or the southern um, states, they get hurricanes. <laughs> so, you know, there's all kinds of things that, that will play into that. And from them to go like in 2016, where they, because people were planting tropical milkweeds now, they, the, their population came up. So it's like a roller coaster. It's, it's like everything. But, you know, we want to help them. So we want to be sure that we give them every opportunity that we can. Now there's another one, another one that I found, insects com the Insect Conser Conservation and Diversity Royal Entomology Society, Volume 5, Issue 2, says three factors of migration decline. Degradation of the forest in the overwintering areas, loss of breeding habitat in the U.S. due to GM crops, again, there we the loss of the milkweed, and continual land development and severe weather and drought. So again, there's two sources there, and there were way more sources that, that are reputable saying that these are the things that's going on. Now when they did, it used to be the farms used to have drainage ditches, and, and on those drainage ditches, there, the milkweed could grow because it was getting the water. Um, now, a lot of them are piped, so there's no open drainage ditches. A lot of them are, a lot of the big, big farms are genetically modified um, crops. So they're able, they're spraying stuff on there to kill weeds and not kill those crops. And that kills the milkweed. So, and then we're developing, I mean, even here in California, we're taking out more land and putting in houses and things like that. So it's up to us to hopefully give them what they need like their babies have got to have the host plants. So again, tropical milkweed to me is a way to fulfill that, that void that the, the native milkweeds just can't do. I mean, it's just not possible for them to do it. It just, mother nature won't allow it. So again, when they're coming down south, we can also provide the nectar plants for them. And we're, we're definitely, we've got a lot of nectar plants here. You know, we've got the, we've got um, sunflowers and cosmos and zinnias and uh, buddleias and yarrow and lantana. I mean, there's a, a ton of stuff here as well as the tropical milkweeds that would provide a nectar for them. So my suggestion is to cut back your tropical milkweeds in November, plant both the tropical and the um, native milkweeds, and also plant some nectar plants for them so when they come back down to go to their overwintering spots, they've got some, some food that they can, they can do that with. So thank you so much for your patience and thank you for, um, listening to what I have to say, and I will be putting out the, um, 
my sources so that you can also do your own research and I suggest you do that because I may have missed something but but I know we all want them to be safe and happy and I thank you for watching and have a great day